because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Uh, Instead of the usual format this week where I bring on a guest, I'm going to share with you a panel I recently did where I was a guest. It was hosted by the Salem Center at the University of Texas at Austin. And one thing that was notable about it was it uh, featured two very smart people that I'm admirers of. One is Greg Salmieri. Uh, you may recognize his name. I mentioned him in the acknowledgments of the first uh, of the moral case for fossil fuels. He helped me a ton in that book with my thinking and explanation and has helped me a lot over the years. So uh, I've known him for 20 years, definitely one of my favorite uh, philosophers who's alive today. And also he is joined by Carlos Carvalho, who is a statistician at the University of Texas at Austin, also a really smart guy. And I think among the three of us, we had a discussion that covered a lot of aspects of the Texas blackouts that hadn't been covered. Greg is really good at asking, I would say, critical questions, not in the sense of of being critical, but in the sense of critical thinking. And so I think he elicited a lot of details about how the grid works, how reliables work, how unreliables work, uh, how, and, and I, I would put it this way, I think one of the big takeaways is how it's it's not just the unreliable energy sources themselves, but the unreliable energy policies that defund reliable and resilient electricity, how that's really at the root of what happened. So I hope you enjoy this discussion. Thanks to the Salem Center for allowing me to share it on my podcast, and I'll be back on the other side. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Greg Salmieri with uh, Carlos Calvalho, both of us of the Salem Center in the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas, Austin. And we have with us today uh, Alex Epstein of um, the Center for Industrial Progress, author, as you'll see on the uh, wall behind him, of The Moral Case for (laughs) Fossil Fuels. And uh, we at the Center have been having a number of events. I think this is our third in the last two weeks on the recent power crisis, the blackouts in Texas that had so many of us without power a couple of weeks ago. And so we're continuing the series to explore uh, why this happened, what lessons there are to draw from it. And um, here we have Alex on to do it with us. Now, um, Alex is of course best known as a proponent of fossil fuels, even a moral proponent of them, which you don't find many of and in particular of the thesis that we need to use more rather than less fossil fuels in the coming decades to promote human flourishing. And we'll talk a bit about that and about the idea of um, people blaming uh, wind and then people blaming fossil fuels and people blaming plants and what uh, blaming the design of different plants and how they're run. But, um, and of course, the questions of whether, whether events like this are due to climate change. But I want to talk more about something more general that's behind uh, Alex's arguments uh, for fossil fuel use that you might agree with even if you come down in a different position with him on the ultimate conclusion there, which is that there's a tremendous value to reliable, affordable, and plentiful energy, and that we often underappreciate that value as a society. So I want to start by talking about that, and because it's something that's very much drawn uh, brought home to you when you don't have it for a week. And uh, I want to talk about just the value of energy, and then we'll move into talking about why that value failed us on this occasion, and um, how to understand the proximate causes of that, and then maybe the more distal causes in, in policy and in our values. So Alex, you're just uh, such an eloquent speaker on this. I wonder if you could say a bit about the value of energy. What is it that people miss? Yeah, I th- <laughs> sorry. The, I think the the key thing with energy is to think of it as machine food or machine calories. So human beings. I mean, the way that the way that I think of it. So I, I think of it in terms of. Yeah, fossil fuels make the world a far better place to live. And I think we need more of them to make the world a far better place to live, particularly for the billions of people who have very little energy and and therefore very little, what I call machine labor uh, in their lives. And, And if we look at, I think it's really important that the natural state of the planet and the natural state of man 
is one of abject poverty for the average person. And there are two basic reasons for this. One is that the planet, contrary to what we're told, is not a delicate nurturer that's stable and sufficient and safe and just will take care of us if we don't disrupt it. It's I think of it as wild potential. It has the amazing potential for human flourishing, but in its natural state, it's dynamic, it's deficient, and it's dangerous. And what that means is that the very livability of the planet for the average human being depends on our productive ability. We need to be able to take the elements of the planet and transform them into values that nourish us, that sustain us, that fulfill us, and that protect us from many of nature's uh, dangers. And the problem throughout history, the reason we're so poor is that our productive ability has been low. And one of the key reasons is we're limited. We've been limited by our physical abilities, by our physical weakness. Human beings simply can't do much physical productive work in very much time. And so when we can't do much work in much time, most of us starve or suffer or struggle. And the only people who at all resemble flourishing are the people who enlist the human power of others, usually in exploitative ways. And so the, the whole modern world we live in, where we have a growing population, where we have a life expectancy that's you know over 70 now, even globally, where the average person has unbelievable amounts of resources at their disposal, that's due to the fact that we have figured out how to produce value using machines. So what a machine can do is a machine can, can do two things that are related. It can amplify our productive abilities and it can expand them. So amplify as an example is a modern combine harvester can allow one human being using a machine to do 700 times the work of the best human being reaping and threshing wheat. So you think about that, one man has turned into a Superman. So yeah, we could do that with our own tools, but we'd be 700 times less productive and most people couldn't do it. And then expand is there are many things that machines do that, human, that no amount of human labor can do. So for example, an incubator that keeps a young baby alive. Like a, you know, human beings just physically aren't capable of doing that. Whereas we can create a machine that creates this amazing environment for humans, the same thing is true for like heating and air conditioning. So what machine labor, as I call it, does is it radically amplifies and expands human productive ability. But machine labor can only exist as long as the machines have food. And the way to think of our lives right now is we live in a machine labor civilization. Every machine that you can see, but also the thousands and millions of machines that are producing all of those machines that you can't see all of them require food or fuel. Now, what determines our ability to use machine labor or not is very much what is the, what I would call the cost effectiveness of the machine food. So to give you an example, I, I've talked about in the next version of my book, what I call the private jet problem. You can think of like private jets are an amazing form of machine labor. They can get us so many places, they can accomplish so many things. Why don't we all use private jets? Well, because it's, it's cost effective for Kim, Tim Cook to use a private jet, right? But it's not cost effective for Alex Epstein or Greg Salmieri because it might cost $50,000 to do it. And a lot of that is involved in the fuel of the machine and all the machines and machines. So it's not cost effective. I call this like, and throughout history, machine labor has not been cost effective for most purposes. So the key that fossil fuels have done is they've provided ultra cost effective machine calories that make possible ultra cost effective machine labor. And, and I want to break down ultra cost effective because that's the term I use now, because it incorporates four elements. So one is the cost. So it makes energy low cost. Two is reliability, provides it a very high reliability. You, you need that for most machines. Versatility, which is something that I'll come up today, I'm sure. So for a wide variety of machines, including heavy duty transport machines like airplanes and cargo ships. And the other one is scale. So it can provide it for billions of people in thousands of places. And in the history of the world through today, there's only one industry that has even come close to ultra cost effective energy production. And that is the fossil fuel industry. The basic reason why it's so hard is that energy is a resource intensive process. So you have to, to make it cost effective, you have to be able to combine all these elements into these processes that are cost effective in this scalable way. Fossil fuels have this amazing advantage of being naturally concentrated, naturally stored, and naturally abundant, unlike say wind and solar, which are naturally intermittent. They're naturally dilute. They are abundant, but 
that that makes it what we'll see much harder for them to provide cost effective, particularly reliable uh, electricity, let alone the rest of energy that they don't provide very well. So this is, that's an overview, but the, the key thing is that fossil fuels are today the only source of ultra cost effective uh, you know, machine food, ultra cost effective energy that makes our whole machine labor society possible. And, and the world, the planet as we know it, the amazing, livable, beautiful place as we know it, is entirely dependent on the degree of cost effective energy that fossil fuels uniquely provide. So the reliability is one aspect of this ultra cost effectiveness. Yeah, and it's a key one. That's why I use cost effectiveness in part because when you talk about cost, and we'll see this with electricity, it's easy to make false apples to apples comparisons, or I mean, they're actually apples to oranges or apples to rotten oranges, I would say sometimes, where we talk about, oh, what's the cost of electricity from this? And actually, one of the problems we'll talk about with the so-called markets is they conflate uh, the cost of different forms of electricity that are very different in their effectiveness. So I like cost effective because it, it captures what you pay for it and then what value you get. So turning, well, before we go further into particular topics, I should say, we're going to open things up to questions from people on the Zoom call um, later on in this chat. So if anybody has any questions, please type them into the Q&A module. You'll find it at the bottom of your screen uh, and you can type them in. We'll, we'll see a running list of them and then we'll be able to, to ask them later on uh, and feel free to type them anytime. We'll uh, incorporate them either at the end or as they seem relevant to, to what we're discussing. Um, moving specifically to electricity, I, before we try to explain the why of this, I, I have a sense and I don't know if it's true or not that wide scale blackouts are becoming more common in America. And I don't know if it's true. I've not read any data on this. I wonder if you or Carlos, if you know, is this the case when I mean, we saw California earlier this year? Of course, we had Texas that we're talking about now. Um, I don't remember when I was in my teens or 20s, um, this scale of thing happening. Yeah, so we're, we're there's, it's actually hard to do research on this. So Stefan Henna, my beloved and amazing researchers, try, we're putting together some accurate things on this, but you have to make a distinction between like a blackout and a statewide power outage. And what we're seeing is definitely the leaders in statewide power outages by a significant margin are Texas and California, or at least these mass power outages, you know, that are lasting for days or that are applying in many, many places. And those are um, increasing, but I want to, I want to just say something about blackouts or mass blackouts, which is we often act like, oh, everything is fine until there is a blackout that we can experience. But there are many intermediate stages of unreliable electricity. And one of the stages is what I call uh, industrial blackouts, which sometimes is euphemistically called demand management, where different grids will cut off industrial customers. Sometimes they make, <clears throat> often they'll make deals about this in advance. But what's happening is that the electricity the, you know, the grid is unable to provide electricity on demand, the amount we need when we need it. And, <clears throat> excuse me, there are these different degrees of that that have been happening. And so I think, you know, when I, when I, was, I was writing last year about Texas, when, when California was happening, I said, hey, this is a problem in Texas too. You know, the head of the, one, one of the public utilities people had said, hey, we've got this dangerous reserve margin. There, I think there are re reliability problems that are manifesting themselves both in these very palpable, worse than palpable blackouts, but also in just the, the decline in reliability to industrial customers. Residential customers tend to be insulated because they raise the most stink. So when you have a mass blackout like this, you're almost certainly in a system that is often playing a kind of game of chicken with reliability. And that is definitely true for California. And it's definitely true for Texas. Okay, good. Part, part of it is, uh, I want to add, I think one thing is the, is the fact that there's, not, there's, no, there's no novelty, I think, from the engineering side that our, our grids in most places in the country is very old and not particularly modernized. And in the management of the, the, how supply meets demand is something that is antiquated also. And I think with the, the sheer scale of things are because of our continued growth, industrial growth, right? The sheer scale of, of the needs are, are not necessarily met by the aging infrastructure. So there's a component of that as well. Yeah, it's particularly frightening here because Texas is growing, right, in terms of uh, lots of people are moving here and um, 
the idea that we're not keeping up with um, with the need for energy is very frightening. So I want to ask about commonalities between Texas and California, but let's first try to get clear on just what happened in Texas and, and what happened proximately. Like we could think about um, what policies or, you know, and uh, might be behind it, but just like, why did the lights go out? So demand spiked because it was especially cold. And so uh -huh. there would have been some trouble meeting be demand um, or rather, you know, we we're in a peak of demand, but there was also problems on the supply side uh, and the problems seem to have ranged over a wide variety of types of power providers. So right. um, uh, there were various problems at different kinds of thermal plants. There were uh, problems with the icing up of, of windmills as well. Do you have a sense of what the range of things that went wrong were just at this kind of more concrete level? Yes, but let me make one point that I think is very valuable to stress, which is that the situation Texas was facing is not unique historically and wasn't even unique during this freeze. So I've, I've documented the case of Alberta, Canada, where they had far colder temperatures and they had, I mean, they had, either there was a slight stress, but there was very, I mean, there was nothing like these kinds of blackouts and they did just fine. And importantly, they are, I think I, I it's something like 43% coal, 40, I think it's 43% coal, 49% gas. And if you look at other regions around the country, around the world, there is a very common pattern of having these highly reliable sources. So it's, it's going to be natural, we can talk about natural gas, which has some limitations here, but natural gas, hydro, coal, and nuclear. Like, and, and particularly these grids almost always have a significant amount of coal and nuclear, which have some su superior properties that, that we'll talk about. Na mainly they store a lot of fuel uh, on site and that tends to be a very big advantage. So when we're talking, because people don't know, people are often analyzing Texas in a sort of vacuum, like, hey, something bad happened here, how, what, how do we explain it? It's important to rule out, there's no, there's no possible inherent problem with fossil fuels, any form of fossil fuels that cause unique problems because we know that fossil fuel plants thrived. And at the same time, we know for a fact that there is nowhere in the world that wind and solar uh, are, you know, are made it possible to get through something like this. In every single case, in the places that are using the most wind and solar through stuff like this, say uh, Denmark and Germany, they are ramping up fossil fuel production, or in Denmark's case, probably importing a lot of fossil fuel production. So the, just the state around the world is in no place are wind and solar making possible it possible to get through these in today's reality. And in myriad places, fossil fuels plus nuclear, but mostly fossil fuels, including gas are making this possible. And what this shows is whatever happened in Texas is not a problem inherent in fossil fuels. It's something endemic to, it's something specific to the Texas situation. And I think the other thing that's important broad context is we're in a culture and a political environment right now where we are talking about eliminating fossil fuels in favor specifically of wind and solar. So there's a piece of legislation that's coming out of the house uh, that's modeled after Biden's objectives. And it says, get off 50% greenhouse gases from 2005 levels, which is basically the same as today's, uh, you know, maybe a little bit higher in by 2030. So nine years. And it says 80% quote, clean electricity in nine years, but hydro is mostly used up, like hydro can only be in specific locations and nuclear is effectively illegal. You, the NRC, I was doing a podcast today, the NRC has not, our Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 1974 has not from beginning to end approved a plant in its entire history. So there's not been one plant that has been conceived and developed in the entire history. Of the, so effectively nuclear is illegal. So what we are saying is in nine years, we have to use overwhelmingly solar and wind. And, and I want to stress that because that's that's important context for this event. And when people will say often in Texas, oh, the wind, we didn't expect the wind turbines to work. We didn't expect solar to work, so they didn't fail. But our whole culture and politics is based on the expectation that they will be able to support us almost entirely. So uh, that so, might seem yeah. like too much preface, but I, I just want to say that. And I think that those facts will make sense of Texas. So even if the, the failure in this case wasn't we were counting on wind and the wind didn't come through because we weren't counting on wind, um, the, plate, the direction we're moving in our energy economy or the direction um, 
the political winds, so to speak, are blowing towards counting on more wind and we won't be able to. Um, yes. But I want to understand um, specifically what, how much we could say about what, I mean, fossil fuel plants can function in this kind of, uh, in this kind of weather. We uh -huh. know that because they do lots of other places. Apparently, um, though they're unreliable, wind plants don't have to ice up the way they did. They, they can prepare them in other places. Right. The problem is the wind doesn't blow. Right. So each when of the problems it. that had us had plants going offline, um, we could have been winterized for, but we weren't. And so the, there's a question as to why we weren't, right? And how does that relate to the factors that might be pushing us more towards wind power? Um, or they, what's the cause of, of that lack of preparation? Oh, let's, let's try to go through sort of step by step. But but I would say that I don't think it's still fully known a lot of what happened. And I think that different parties have come up with explanations that are most convenient to them. But what we know for sure is, I mean, we know for sure that Texas, and we'll talk more in detail about this, but they have a grid and a system that is overwhelmingly incentivized to maximize the amount of wind and solar on the grid at a given time. That is something that Republicans and Democrats in Texas have been very proud of, that they emphasize and they love to have statistics that say, you know, we used 25%, 17%, whatever it is, wind for our electricity this year. And so what that means is that they, whenever the wind is blowing, they want to use it to the max and they want to ramp down everything else. And in practice, that means ramp down natural gas because natural gas is the most flexible form uh, of power. So we know that going into this week of the cold spell, wind was at times providing more than half the electricity. So we know that that is happening. This is in contrast to the standard way of producing electricity, where you have something reliable like coal and nuclear providing what's called the base load, which is the minimum continuous demand at a given time. And so the usual thing is you have the ultra reliable thing, it's firing, it's working, it's base load, and then the flexible deals with the peaks. But here you were at like half the base, the, what would be the base load level, because you're trying to accommodate as much wind as possible. So we know that what happened is demand went way up. At the same time, the wind went down. It's true that there was some freezing of turbines, but that wind would have got, was going down anyway, as happens all the time. So the freezing was just compounding the issue. So wind and solar were, as I say, like almost totally out to lunch during the part where electricity is needed. And then what Texas was counting on in its plans was the ability to ramp up natural gas in, a, in an incredible way. So to be producing four times, you know, in a week to ramp up natural gas production by four times. So we know that that, that's definitely, that was definitely the situation coming into, which should already give us pause. Like that is a really radical thing to do, to ramp up your production of natural gas. I mean, you're bringing plants that are offline. Online, you just have to do all of these things. It's not like you're running a nuclear plant and it's humming and you just supplement it. So there was this huge burden on natural gas. And what we see is that natural gas was meeting that burden and to some extent met that burden impressively throughout. But at a certain point, uh, there was a mismatch between supply and demand. And this is where there's a lot of controversy about what happened, because there's a question of to what extent did sort of, all, because of their own failings, the plants quote unquote freeze. So it was, a, they're just like these bad weather conditions and then they just couldn't handle it or was it, but there are other things that could have happened and we know to some extent uh, did happen. So for example, to what extent was ERCOT you know, everyone knows that term now. Now, to what extent was ERCOT not, did they not properly engage in what's called demand management or, or rolling blackout? So when, when the uh, demand was exceeding the supply, forcibly cutting off the demand. And if you don't do that in time, your frequency gets low and then what's called plants trip. And so there are different arguments and we've heard testimony that certain utilities are saying, our plants were not, it wasn't that they weren't winterized, they tripped, but then once they trip, they're really hard to start up and probably even harder to start up in the cold. And this is the kind of fact finding I don't think has been done diligently in terms of it. So I don't think we know what the balance was between the plants certainly couldn't handle the cold just on their own versus there was this kind of uh, tripping that happened. So. I mean, I'll, I'll pause there. Just there's there's more to say about sort of how we got in this situation, but I think that is the we were you know in that situation they were counting on like 
they were counting on natural gas basically doing everything or almost everything. And they were not able to do that through some combination of the plants tripping offline because of grid mismanagement and the plants, oh, and the, and the plants winterization type issues. But also there's a lot of interesting stuff about what did they cut off the supply? Uh, did they cut off the supply? So when natural gas is providing the heat for many of the homes, it's also providing a, a lot of, you know, well, a lot of electricity, obviously. So what happened there? Did they cut off, cutting off electricity to the Permian Basin where the gas comes from? Did that lead to shortfalls of gas? That's another dynamic. And, and among those three, I haven't yet seen a definitive breakdown. And I don't know if we know that yet. So I think there's some root causes behind that, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but I think that's, that's concretely what happened. So, so I, I will add a couple of things to that. Uh, we had a guest on Monday uh, which spoke in similar issues. And one of the things that I found striking in, the, in looking at the data is that we have uh, a moment in time where you lose in, almost immediately something like eight gigawatts of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard to explain that at everybody freezing at the same time. Right, particularly I, across I the state. That, yeah, yeah. So I think I think that there's a huge indication that the tripping was starting to happen there because it was too unstable. The grid was too unstable, right? And some plants might be might be going offline, and and that's that. I think it's it. it I think we lost something like 16 gigawatts of power uh, within a period, and part of it was tripping, part of it was like freezing, part of it was a lot of things that 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 they were taking place, as you pointed out. But yeah, I think the fact that it was simultaneously, it, it's really important. The, the other thing I want to add. Let me also, just break in, Carlos, before you do that, because we have Roman online. Oh, yeah. uh, asking us what's meant by tripping. And I think we should answer oh, that yes, yes, before yes. we go forward if people are following. Well, so it just means it, it, it gets cut off in a way where, I mean, the, the, for all intents and purposes, it's, it gets cut off in a way where it's hard to bring it back on. So what'll happen is like if, for instance, if the frequency is too low, it'll, it has things inside it because it'll get, the electronics will get totally screwed up if it operates on too low a frequency. So it'll just, it'll just, it has in, it'll just cut off. Basically. It's a safety mode. Yeah, it's a safety mode. It's like like you have a, a, a switch in your house that sometimes you know the, the 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 breaker breaks down, right? So the same same idea. There's too dangerous for the plant to operate. But the like other a thing is gonna, breaker tripping. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the other thing, and, and then it's not like turning it on again very easily. That's the other part that 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 we also discussed in previous meetings here is that it takes a while. It's not an easy thing to bring it back online to the grid. You have to be done that very carefully, otherwise you mess up everybody else. I think the, other, part of the point I was going to make, Greg, just one second, is that is that just to be clear, given that the demand that we saw was something that was way above what a normal winter peak would be. So if gas, none of the, the gas had gone offline none of it had gone offline, we would still have had a blackout of about four, we had a gap of about four gigawatts. Um, and so there's, you know, there was nothing we could have done in that situation, given that, you know, even at capacity, right? I think that was a, that was an important thing to bring up, which you see speaks to Alex's point. The idea, I saw figures that of the, the breakdown of different energy from different sources over this period. And what was striking to me is that during the, if, if I might be reading this wrong, but during the period where we were uh, in crisis, we were getting more energy from gas, even with some of our gas plants offline, more energy from gas than we got from gas, wind, and solar combined. You mean, uh, wait. Sorry, more from gas. No, I mean, so just from gas, that it seemed to be taking up all of what the wind and solar had done on wind and solar's past recent day. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, even at the at the worst point, it was performing at way above normal. So the the issue, and, and one thing to say about these blackouts that's important, and this is also true of, of California, because I know we want to talk about parallels and it's true of other places. These, it's like there's always some sort of specific operator error when you have a blackout because they make plans. Like again, they had a plan to use gas in this situation, but the point is it's not a very, for reasons we'll discuss, it's not a very good plan. And it's it's a plan with a very small margin for error. So in California, what happened is you can point to, okay, well, the sun, I mean, the sun goes down every day. That should have been, and it is some sense was anticipated, but then it's a heat wave and the wind is low. And then what they'll say is, oh, well, we just failed to contract enough power from the neighboring state. So nothing to see here, we just failed to contract enough power. Interestingly, this summer we've contracted for a ton of fossil fuel power in California, despite our you know, renewable objectives. But 
it's they're playing this game I call reliability chicken, where they're trying to say, okay, let's get away with as much of what I would call the unreliables as possible, as much of the intermittent wind and solar as possible. And like, yeah, if everything goes according to plan and there's no errors by us, then it'll be okay. But this is part of why you have what's called the reserve margin, which is you, you want to be able to account for different kinds of errors, including operator error. So I'm sure that ERCOT made some operator error. And so it's if we're talking about the cause of like a total of a, a very atypical type of disaster, there's always going to be a bunch of bad decision making. But the issue is you had a system that's much more prone to this type of error. So you don't want to just analyze, hey, what you know, what, what did stupid people do in this situation, but rather how is this system more prone to these, to not only this scale of disaster, but also what I would call more intermediate disasters, including that industrial customers can't get electricity as reliably and that you're heading in a certain direction where you have less and less margin for error. So I'm understanding the fundamental that you're pointing out here in um, causes of there being more blackouts and more of these industrial blackout cases. It's when you have forms of power that you're in control of, you expect there to be lots of fluctuations in demand, in other circumstances, something breaks or goes offline. And because you have control over what the output of the power source is, you can scale it up or scale it down to meet needs. Um, the more power plants, we, the more power sources we have on a grid that aren't like that, that they come up and on or offline or, or, or higher or lower sources of energy, based on things we don't control, the more we have to use the sources that we can control to compensate for the variability in the ones that we can't control. And therefore the less overall control we have in situations where there are other unexpected needs we need to meet or other variables outside of our control come into, uh, into play. And so what a grid that is, uh, what, adding a renewable or as you call it unreliable, adding a, a power source that's intermittent to a grid in a case where you could have added a source that was reliable or it's replacing a source that was reliable and that you were in control of, the overall effect of that is giving you less control over how much energy you can produce until less control in a disaster type situation. Yeah, it makes it more likely. Yeah, so the, yeah, the key is, I mean, if you want to use technically, I use reliable and unreliable, but controllable and uncontrollable is probably the most precise way of thinking about it. And, you know, the miracle of the grid is that it is able to match supply, you know, production to demand all the time. And, and as we see with these plants tripping, you need to do that exactly. Because if you, if you just miss it by even a little bit, you're screwed. And so the key, how do we handle this uncontrollable demand is with controllable supply. But what we've been doing with this reliability chicken is we've been trying to add as much uncontrollable supply as possible and then hope that the controllable supply will be able to account for not only the uncontrollable demand, but also the uncontrollable supply, but also to cut costs. See, the, the normal thing, you won't have much in the way of blackouts if you keep the same amount of controllable supply on the grid as you had before. So if you just, like, let's just say you wanna optimize for wind and solar. So you build out all these wind turbines and solar panels, but you don't change the amount of uh, you know, gas and coal and nuclear and stuff, you know, you can have a pretty reliable grid, but what happens is that drives up costs a lot because you're adding this infrastructure, this uncontrollable energy infrastructure, but then you still need the controllable energy infrastructure. Plus it's less fuel efficient because the controllables have to go up and down and that's like driving and stop and go traffic. And there's all these like transmission line type costs and that kind of thing. So what happens is they want to cut costs. This is what happens in California, happens in Texas. They cut the controllable sources while like sort of demanding more of them. And that's why I call this reliability uh, chicken. And so that's the places that are having these conspicuous blackouts are the places that are really trying to cut the costs by cutting the controllable power sources. And what you're seeing around the country is there's more, there's there's less and less margin for error. Like even in the Southwest Power Pool, which is near Texas, you saw like a lot of problems there. People were talking about, oh, you should be on a national grid, but Texas's neighbors were not doing very well. And in and, and California, you know, we import over 30% of our electricity, something like that, about 30% of our electricity, but we're counting on our neighbors. But our neighbors are starting to also 
go away from the controllable power sources. So everybody is trying to get away with using as much of this uncontrollable electricity as possible. And so these blackouts are just a preview of what life under this is, is like. And act, interestingly, the solution from the people advocating the unreliables or uncontrollables is what they call demand management, which is basically we get controlled by the amount of weather that exists. So ultimately it's, yeah, we, that if there's not enough sunlight, you know, we can't turn our, our up and down our thermostat. Like that is, uh, that is what is actually going to happen. We're seeing that happen in Germany. And that really reveals that these are not cost-effective substitutes, but rather they're part of imposing an energy, like a, a less energy using way of life that many of the advocates are very comfortable with. They're very comfortable with, yeah, okay, well, if you can't charge your electric car for a couple hours, we're okay with that. Or if you, you know you have to be a little colder than you'd like, or a little warmer than you'd like, like we're okay with that. So that's that's the direction this is heading in. So again, it might not be just blackouts all the time, but it will be a lack of available power in the way that we're used to uh, compared to what we're used to. This is Obama saying back early <laughs> in the administration, you can't think you can keep the house at 17 degrees all the time. Right. It's the idea that um, to, even if it wasn't less energy, like maybe over the course of a year under such a regime, we'd use just as much energy, uh, although probably not. But what we're talking about is less control of our energy. And part of what yeah. machines and energy give us is you can control what the temperature is in your house when you go someplace. And um, it's sad to think of losing that. And t Texas is very, sorry, Texas is very, at least internally from talking to people, like Texas tends to take pride in demand management, which I find to be pretty shameful, but they're like, yeah, we can do all of this and we're really clever because we can come up with all these deals with companies where we'll, we'll cut off your power and do this. And sometimes that can be economic, like it can make sense to do that. But in general, the tendency, again, the focus, which we'll talk more about is the focus is how can we accommodate as much wind and solar? That becomes an end in itself. And then everything else gets, yeah, if we have to run a small reserve margin, okay, so be it. If we have to cut off customers or come up with all these arrangements where you can't count on reliable power, so be it. And, and with the latter, it's that's really bad for industry long-term. Like there are a lot of, a person was writing to me from South Africa, an engineer from South Africa. And he said, look, we don't have blackouts all the time. We just lost all our industry. And, you know, that that can happen for sure. And, you know, you it, just as a comparison, China has five times the industrial electricity use as America already. Let's um, shift to the topic of um, the energy market in Texas, the um, what's called energy only market. Before I do that, let me just mention another uh, uh, topic that's a kind of you know possible elephant in the room. I mean, we're talking about um, these things being consequences of a desire to get more wind and solar on the grid. The reason people want to get more wind and solar on the grid, of course, is because there's worry about climate change and fossil fuels contributions to climate change. Um, we can talk about that problem and other possible ways of solving it on another occasion, nuclear, how big a problem is it? Can we meet it with energy? But let's not talk about that here. Let's just notice that maybe it is, there maybe there are compelling reasons to want to use more wind and solar. Even if so, we want to know what the costs are. And if the costs of doing that include a less reliable energy system, having to move away from, uh, having to move away, you know, not being able to have industry, having to have demand management in the way Alex is talking about, that's something that we have to acknowledge when we think about this. And then we can factor that in with everything else um, and decide what to do. So Let's, I think we can be suspicious, though, that there is an insistence on wind and solar in particular, and there's significant opposition in the U.S. among the environmental groups to hydro and above all to nuclear. And so, I mean, we know nuclear is like in the leading source of what they call clean electricity in the U.S. Just to give you a scary statistic, this year is a record shutdown of nuclear plants. You know, we're talking about reducing CO2 emissions. We're having record. So more nuclear plants are being shut down than any other kind. So there's something, and, and if you know how nuclear works, like they're known as expensive to build, I think way too expensive because of regulation that borders on criminalization. But once they're up and running, they're quite cheap because uh, the fuel is fuel is very low cost. And so the, I should just say that if we, I agree the climate issue is too much to bite off tonight, but it should be very suspicious that we're insisting on these unreliable forms of electricity when we have hydro 
and we have particularly nuclear, which can scale better than hydro. And there's an outright aversion to them and very little interest in them from the current administration. They haven't ruled them out, but they're doing nothing to address the fact that they're getting driven out of business. And in fact, when we talk about the energy markets and the problems, many of those things are actively driving nuclear power plants uh, out of business. So I, I wouldn't equate what's going on right now with wind and solar. It should not be in your mind as this is what it means to take con climate concerns seriously. This is one way that should be suspicious. Good. So let's talk about the what is going on in Texas. And let's talk about the energy market, which you just um, alluded to, I think. Um, so we have what's called an energy only market here, as opposed to a capacity market. We can talk about what it means for these things to be markets. But um, Alex or Carlos, because Carlos, I know you've thought about this a lot too. Could you explain what the difference is and what the reasons are um, that we have the kind of market we do? What are the what what are profit is the reason for it? I'll let I'll let Carlos do it because I have I have a pretty damning view of all of these quote markets. So, but I think it would be interesting to hear Carlos's perspective because he might he might be able to highlight some elements of them that I will uh, dismiss. So the basic rationale is simple is that you don't want to pay for plants to be idle when they're not being needed. So if you want to have a capacity market, what you do is you say, okay, we need this much capacity always available and people bid to get in there. And then that cre you know, creates a, a level of prices that might be, that are typically higher than places that say, well, no, we're going to have an energy only where you just pay for the energy consumed. So we, we are just saying you have the incentives to build production out there because if prices are high, you're going to get paid for it. Prices will fluctuate and they're going to incentivize people to build uh, when needed. So that, that's the theoretical idea that a market that matches supply and demand. Again, it's problem to call it a market, as Alex probably is going to point out, is because the price signal only works for the producer. It doesn't work for the consumer in a lot of places because a lot of us don't have a price signal to say, hey, keep at 55 your house because right now is $9,000 a kilowatt hour. We didn't have that, right? In Austin, we have a, a, a monopoly and a fixed price no matter what, which then it, it, it's a problem. So, so, you know, it's hard to think about that as, as a true market. But that's the, the main the, the objective is to have something that, that provides people the incentives to produce based on a price signal. And you only pay for that. And, you know, sometimes it's going to be expensive, sometimes it's going to be cheap. In general, it's actually pretty cheap. Um, and the capacity one, you have to sort of guarantee a certain level or existence. So people get paid to build factories and so on. And so one example for you to see that there is a, a reason why uh, prices tend to be lower, not a reason, a, a, a point of evidence why prices are lower here is that the industrial consumers of energy in Texas, they fight tooth and nail in the political system not to create a capacity market. They don't want a capacity market because they know that in our situation, it's, it will generate a higher price of energy, which is a huge part of their costs, right? So, so that's a, a clear indication that prices are better in, in, in the markets that we have. Uh, but then you have this issue, there's no safety net. There's no safety net in an event like, like this because we don't have idle capacity sitting there. Uh, I, now, Alex, one question I have for you on this, that to me is one of the things that I, I sort of didn't thought about before this event is that to me, it strikes me that there's a, a fundamental incompatibility uh, incompatibility between a, a market of, for energy only and unreliables in your in your term in terminology because one the unreliables have zero marginal cost so they drive prices down in times where they're blowing and the sun is shining to a point where it makes it hard for anybody else to compete with them and at the same time when you know you might need a situation where the need is there they cannot help you at all right so mm -hmm. you, you kill the incentives for people to, to, to build stuff because prices will never make, make up for those times where you have negative energy prices in Texas. Uh, so it seems to yeah. me that two things cannot match. Yeah. So I, I want to answer that. Make sure I answer that because I have something to say. First, I just want to make sure I don't forget about that because I, I agree. To, but my short version of that is, yes, these kinds of quote unquote markets worked much better when there were exclusively reliables like when you have energy only markets that are like natural gas, coal, they're still problematic. They overly favor natural gas, but natural gas is a totally different degree of reliability and even resiliency than wind and solar. But let me just talk. Uh, so in terms of why don't I, I think of these as not markets, I think of them as payment policies. So the, you know, electricity today is basically a monopoly. So it's, it's the government controls it and the government decides how are we, what, what mix of power sources are we going to use? 
to supply consumers, that's not just residential consumers, but industrial consumers with electricity. This is totally controlled by the government. And so I think it's best thought of as you can think of it like a large industrial consumer like Apple, like how does Apple make, now actually Apple is really bad because they're, they throw away a lot of money to get certain kinds of, of credibility. But you think about like just a standard kind of, you know, large set of factories, what would they do? What they would do, the competition that would be involved there is they would kind of look at what are our power needs and then what combination of producers over the long term will be able to meet uh, our power needs. Like if you just, if there was only kind of one company that was doing this, it would do what I call like long-term system cost analysis. So look at like the next 20 years, what can we expect to need? And then so what balance of like nuclear plants, coal plants, gas plants. And the key is that you would think of it as a whole. You'd think of it as, cause it's ultimately one giant electricity generating machine. So you'd really think about like what pieces of the puzzle will fit together. And generally what I mentioned before is you tend to have this model called base load plus flexible where you have certain kinds of power plants that are very reliable, very resilient that run really efficiently at a constant rate like nuclear and coal. You have the, them as the base load, they're kind of running all the time. And then you have natural gas, maybe a little hydro storage sometimes if, if you have that available to handle the, the flexibility. But you're looking at like, what is the lowest kind of system cost? So that's the default thing. Now, the way that used to be done involved had all sorts of incentive issues because you would basically pay people based on the cost of them building it. And that would lead to different kinds of overruns, but the old system was very, very good in terms of reliability. And reliability, we can see what it costs to not have reliability. I mean, you know, it's more than all of Texas electricity costs for a year, just the cost of this one blackout. So let alone what it does to the industry and, and productivity during that time and then the loss of life. So the old system had problems, but it, 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 was, it was very good in terms of reliability. And it was, so this system, the key is it is a monopoly, like these quote unquote markets are monopolies. And basically what they do, particularly the energy part, which are that even in places with capacity markets, the energy markets are the dominant force where most of the money goes. What they do is they say like, hey, we want to pay whoever gives us the lowest price on like a five minute interval. And that's how it works. And I just want to point out, this is a completely arbitrary thing that people set up as a quote market. Now, when you have all reliables, you can sort of get away with this, although it still doesn't, if you're doing energy only, there's still issues with like resilience and different kinds of things. But when you allow solar and wind in the situation, that is a complete nightmare because it's, it's like if you had a company and you said, okay, I am going to give the work to whatever person offers to do it at the lowest price in the next five minutes. And that's how I'm going to do it. What would happen to your reliable employees? They'd be getting paid less and you'd ultimately drive them out of work or you'd have to pay them more to stay. Plus you'd have to pay these unreliable employees. So that's, you would never, when you were bidding on employees or something, when you were coming up with a pay, I want to stress payment policy, when you're coming up with a payment policy for employees, you would not do at all what they're doing. You wouldn't equate reliable and unreliable. You'd say, I want to figure out what to pay employees so I get the reliable work I need over the long term. So I want to stress just this is a totally arbitrary policy that is particularly crazy when you have all these unreliables. And then on top of that, when the unreliables are subsidized, because what you have is the, with what's called the production tax credit for wind, is they can actually pay the grid. And this has been happening to industrial friends of mine. They can pay the grid to take their power that's not even needed. Like that's how perverse it is. So they, they can not only sell at zero, they can sell at less than zero. And also, by the way, another feature that's arbitrary of the way it works is when, when you know they bid, there's this bidding system, but they don't get paid what they bid. They get paid... Uh, the highest price that anyone gets paid. So they can bid negative like one cent for a kilowatt hour. But if the highest price at a given time is paid seven cents, they get seven cents. So I just want to stress, this is a completely arbitrary system. It is not a market in the real sense. A real market would be we had property rights. You were allowed to build competing electric grids and then consumers would choose. But I think in a monopoly situation, this idea of long-term system cost analysis is very important. And I definitely see no case on an energy market, if you're going to have that, to allow reliables to compete with unreliables. You should have some serious reliability threshold, which doesn't mean you can't use solar and wind, but it would mean that you'd have to package it in a kind of black box 
where it was combined with gas, where it's combined with batteries, whatever you need to deliver power reliably. Right now, it just can't work because if you have the right to deliver unreliable power and then everyone else has to pay the price in this, there's no way to have any kind of responsibility. So I think the, the today's energy markets are around the country, I think are just corrupt and they're not deregulated, they're not free, and they are totally rigged for these unreliables and against uh, reliability. So I just want to stress they're not markets, they're irrational payment policies that favor unreliables. So can you, why do we have that, if that's what's happening in Texas of all places? Like if California had that, you know, Texas is supposedly a red state. Well, most places have this. A state that takes climate issues less seriously. Why is it so much here? Um, I wonder, is the fact that the energy only market favors <clears throat> gas somewhat over coal? Uh, is Were there political pressures for that reason? Or how how did the, the forces that want that kind of a, a market get, um, get the political capital to make that happen? Well, but I would just stress that the energy only, so the energy only market is sort of bringing out the irrationality of this auction or bidding system. But the ones with capacity markets have, like those are all over the country and they have all kinds of reliability problems as well. So the capacity markets do not, so, so part of the capacity markets is you have to make calculations like how much are the unreliables worth? And they tend to dramatically overrate them in terms of how valuable they are. Some people argue they're of negative value, but it, so in general, there's in every place or particularly what's called the RTO system, uh, there's a really good book on this that I recommend all the time called Shorting the Grid that sort of breaks down how we've devolved from our old system to the current one. But it's not just energy only markets. It's the energy markets and the completely insufficient capacity markets around the country that are doing this. So why did Texas have energy only? I, I suspect it's for some of the reasons Carlos said, because at certain points it can be cheaper. Uh, yeah, also, there's been a decent amount of lobbying by oil and natural gas for wind, particularly the more natural gas type people. There's been a lot of opportunism there. And I do think that, I mean, Texas has seen wind as like, we're really, so Texas is sometimes very pro-free or relatively pro-freedom, but sometimes it has a kind of quasi-nationalism, whatever the state version of nationalism is. And so it's like, oh, here's what's unique about us in Texas, like we have a lot of wind and we're, you know, we do green better than California does. Like we're so smart. And there's kind of that Texas nationalism that goes on. And I think that particularly because the wind and solar movement has had such a moral high ground, there's, there was an eagerness to just jump on that and say, oh, like we're, we're so good at this. Like we're even better than the other places. But you can see very clearly from not everyone in Texas, but definitely leaders of both parties there's been a real emphasis on um, wind. And I, and I think also there's been a pragmat, I mean, you and I are not philosophically in favor of what we'd call, what we understand as pragmatism, but there's been this idea of, yeah, we can have a bunch of wind and our electricity can still be relatively cheap, particularly if natural gas prices are plummeting. So we've had plummeting natural gas prices. And despite that around the country, electricity prices have been going up. So what's happened is the natural gas and and to some extent, coal prices have been depressing prices, but the renewables slash unreliables have been increasing them by adding all of this unnecessary infrastructure. So we've gotten away more than we should with low with uh, with doing this because gas prices have gone down. But in Texas, there's they've gone down so much and they're cheap that Texas has been able to have quite low electricity prices. So there's been this idea, oh, we can get away with it, even though their prices would be lower and their reliability would be higher with wind. So I see if you look back at the different people leading Texas, yeah, there's been this kind of pragmatism, this ability, this desire to embrace the wind and solar and to be kind of superior about it. And also, I, I don't know if this is publicly documented, but also this view of, yeah, ERCOT is, we're really smart. We can manage demand. Uh, you know, we're, we're really clever. So, so I, I just add to that, uh, uh, Greg, the fact that there's a time shift here on when the market, the, the market, the energy market, the energy only market was built was way before we had any uh, degree of wind and solar in the system, I think. And it was very much based on fossil fuels. And I think it was, as Alex mentioned, it was easier to manage things in that space, right? Um, then the subsidies start coming in. And by the way, the subsidies 
it's not only federal subsidies, we have state subsidies as well. One of the things that the state had to do to subsidize the existence of solar and, 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 and uh, wind was to create transmission lines. It's much harder. You have to have much more transmission, right? To spread out where the wind and the solar is opposed to concentrated uh, uh, power plants. So they basically pay collectively for that, which is, which is something that doesn't, you know, doesn't get charged to producer wind or, or, or solar. So in some ways, I mean, the, the state also helped that. And I think Alex is right in the sense that we're very proud of the fact that we're the leaders in energy, clean energy in, in, in solar and, and wind. And, and, you know, we can do it here or COT can manage this. And I think there was a lot of skepticism of our ability to manage that increase in, the, the, in the, our supply on renewables. And because it has worked out so far, well, great. We're tap, patting ourselves on the back, right? And then this happens. Uh, yeah, well, I just want to start one sentence because I, I think Carlos made a great point. And just to emphasize what you said earlier, it's plausible that as a payment policy, a combination of these energy quote markets and capacity markets would be a good idea if you had ex very high reliability standards. Like that's plausible. And it's even a little bit plausible that an energy only market could be good if you had all reliables. If you really could do as I mean, I, I'm skeptical, but like, if you really had a lot of super flexible industrial customers who basically said, yeah, we're willing to have, we want, like, we're making things where we don't need 24 seven production. We can use lower electricity. Like we can go offline for two weeks if necessary, then you could sort of get away with it. But uh, yeah, the better, I think there were some good people designing these. Uh, I, I have some skepticism about them anyway, but once you allow unreliables on them, it is a total uh, mess. And, and, and the so price that chronology signal. is important. Right. And, and the price signal as well, right? The fact that consumers don't have, to, the industrial consumers might have the price signal, but the, 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 the residential ones don't. Yeah, and that, 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 should, that, 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 should, that should change. I remember talking to one of, I studied Enron a long time ago, and I, there were some really smart people there. And I remember they were talking about California and they're saying like, these, I was, there was, is during the California crisis. And, and this guy, one of the leaders of Enron was telling me like, I went to this, I was at this place in California and they're running heat lamps all over the restaurants with natural gas. And the idea is just the consumer is totally disconnected. So yeah, if you do have an energy market, this kind of thing, I, I think a better version of that, certainly the consumer would be uh, very sensitive to it. The idea that, oh yeah, you just keep using no matter what and you get a fixed price. That's, uh, that's another kind of corruption. So just to, to get clear on what, or just to underline, the respect in which you are blaming the, um, the uncontrollable power sources for, for these kind of events happening. It's not, you sometimes hear the argument, the wind didn't blow, wind failed us, we didn't have wind. Now, it's not that the problem is on this date, we expected there to be wind and there wasn't. It's that a, a system that has a lot of these resources on it, uh, a system that's built to accommodate the needs of resources we can't control, is a system that's not built to give us power in a controllable way when we need it. And yes. so it's the, the type of system we have that's geared towards the verities mm -hmm. of, um, um, of the, verisimil yeah, the verisimilitudes of uh, wind and solar and so forth is a kind of system that is itself more unreliable, even if uh, they're not the dominant uh, factor on the system. So that's, yes. the, that's the, the case to be made here. And you can think of it as, as the pro, so I think of it as like, the, it's not the wind and solar failed as much as it's the wind and solar policies, they defund reliable production. And that includes the quantity of these reliable power plants, but also resiliency uh, measures. And so to draw a parallel to California, so there's documented, you know, we in California had this big insistence on wind and solar and meeting these different targets. And PG&E, one of the utilities that had this catastrophe in the past several years, you know, they were asking for, I think it was about $5 billion for maintenance, including different kinds of power line issues that subsequently caused or contributed to wildfires. And they, it was really hard for them to get anything, I think. And then they only got half of it. And part of it was, we don't want to jeopardize our green energy plans by giving sticker shock to the consumers. And as I mentioned, the, the issue that always that happens a lot is when you're using more of these unreliable slash uncontrollables, it puts upward, it, it 
it increases your costs. And so there's this tendency to play reliability chicken and get rid of both reliability, but also investments in kind of in resilience. And that can include maintenance of the power lines, that can include any kind of, of winterization. So I think the concept of defunding the reliability and resiliency is, is very important. And that is an inevitable consequence of emphasizing these uncontrollable power sources. So Alex, let me ask you a question. Does I think a lot of people out there have a, a, a tendency to think that, oh, if, if only we had a political will, we could be in a system where we have 80% of our energy coming from renewables, right? It's only these Republicans that are staying in the way and they're not stopping, mm -hmm. not allowing us to get there. What's possible? Like what when you're, when you're assessing, <laughs> like, you know, how, because, yeah, so what's possible? Well, think? but it's a question, I think it's, it's there's the question, I know this is well, true costs, from you, right? 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 Yeah, exactly. Because I'm saying right. you're you're from an economics, but it, it's it's energy is always an economic question, and it's almost always portrayed as a technological question or a technical question. So it's portrayed as how can we have a system where we're getting uh, like almost all of our energy from solar and wind? And the issue is, well, could you do that? Well, in a sense. I mean, in a sense, you can't because you need oil to like mine for the stuff and there aren't even machines. That can, but you could use a hell of a lot of solar and wind and batteries. I mean, what you can do is you can have very little electricity and very little, so you could have a system that just doesn't produce much electricity and doesn't produce it reliably. Or you could, I mean, to some extent, although you can't even do this, but you could use all of human labor to, and all of human time to construct this Rube Goldberg system that then all we would do would be generating electricity for things that we can't even afford to do. So the, the key with today's electricity use isn't some magical thing. Like it's not at some perfect level. It's, it's the level that's cost effective. So if you double, triple, quadruple, quintuple the price of energy, then what? It, then it, it's just nothing works. So the issue is, can any, what we've, we've been, we talk about having these arbitrary goals of not only carbon neutral, but like specifically hundred percent wind and solar. And the point is those, they're not practically achievable because they would, to, to do anything like what we have today would just completely impoverish you. But it's, it's, there's something off with just acting like, oh, what would it cost us to do this as if we'd end up with the same kind of thing? No, every, energy dictates the cost of everything. So everything would be more expensive. We would just waste all of our time creating this massive thing, particularly the batteries, I think are important. So I've, I've shown a lot of graphs on, if you look at my Twitter, uh, about just what happened with wind and solar. And I, I describe it as, you know, they're out to lunch when you need power the most. And so there's a question of what would have provided it during particularly like a cold spell that's very regional, it's all over the place. So you're not getting a lot of wind and solar from other places. What provides it? And it's, it's batteries, but I think my calculation was you know, in 2020, all of our utility scale batteries had something like 16 seconds of US electricity and they can't even discharge it. So like 16 seconds. And then I think Texas was at like lost 60% of capacity and the batteries don't even function in the cold. So you would never, these, these things are all just totally arbitrary. And I would argue ideological or religious goals to say we want X percent wind and solar. They're not economic goals at all. There's no, no company without some other desire to use wind and solar or no system would ever say, hey, maybe the most cost-effective way to produce electricity is to use this stuff that's almost totally unavailable for potentially like days and weeks at a time. And that also you use these batteries that don't function very well in these kinds of cold conditions. So there, you know, it's just completely, it's just very cost ineffective at today's small scale. And it, it gets much, much worse as you, as you scale it, because you have to build more and more solar panels and wind turbines. You still need the reliables because you don't, you can't have cost effective batteries. And so you're just building more and more uh, with no real benefit. Whereas if you want to, again, if you want to deal with CO2, build a nuclear plant, a nuclear plant is a self-sufficient thing. So you use a bunch of fossil fuels to build it, but not, uh, and I don't think any more than solar and wind, but it can actually generate reliable power on its own indefinitely. But again, there's very little interest in that because I think there's more, it's more about the, uh, the philosophy or the religion behind renewable and wind and solar, which is this idea that we need to live a more natural uh, existence. We need to impact the planet less versus 
we actually need to find cost-effective ways to get power without CO2. Because if you want to do that, nuclear is basically your only option. There's no, nothing more unnatural than using the technology of the sun, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what so, do you mean? That, well, in the sense that that's what nuclear essentially is. Right? Now, I, I understand it's fission, not fusion, but it's still, it's nuclear energy is pretty natural. So so people hate that. that uh, they think that it's like, you know, some sort of like terrible technological advance that makes hybrid you know, chimera animals out, out, out of explosions and things like that. <laughs> let, let, I had envisioned us going for about an hour and we're, we're over that. Let's um, wrap up by talking a bit about the values that are behind all of this. So you're talking about the, Alex, you're character, characterizing them as religious or ideological values behind um, the, the uh, the green agenda or the agenda to want to switch to solar and wind a as opposed to nuclear or fossil fuels. Um, so that's the ideology of wanting to, to put it in, um, in literal religious terms, it is biblical terms, tread lightly on the earth, um, that there's, it's important that we not have a big footprint. That's where the footprint language comes from, right? What are the, how would you describe the values that motivate that? And um, you have the human flourishing project behind you. So what are the, how does the set of values that stand behind reliable, affordable, plentiful, uh, what's the new one, ultra cost-effective energy relate to human flourishing as a standard? Yeah, so ultra cost-effective is just like low cost, reliable, versatile, global scale. Those are the four elements of it. Yeah, so just, uh, to emphasize what I said before, like there's something off with saying, I consider CO2 like a mortal threat to human existence in the coming decades. And I am significantly opposed to hydro and there is significant, so hydro is not considered renewable by most classifications. That's very important. But renewable supposedly means what? Like naturally renews. Well, water naturally goes to the top of a river with evaporation. So it's certainly as renewable as the sun and the wind. If that, now the problem is the, none of the processes are renewable, so it doesn't make any sense. But it's certainly as renewable, but it's not classified as renewable. Why? Because it's viewed as having too much impact on the earth. Like it interfe interferes, I'll say, with free flowing rivers. So you have a lot of these leading organizations are anti-hydro or what they would call big hydro, which is really most and cost-effective hydro. And then certainly nuclear. And if you look at the opposition to nuclear, like what is it really about? They say it's about safety, but if you look at the stats, it's nuclear is the safest form of energy ever created. It can't explode in the way that basically everything else can. So it's actually, you can recover from, you don't have these terrible tragedies where people just die instantaneously. So it's actually the safest. So that's, and you'd be willing to put up with quite a bit of danger if you really believed it would save the planet. Of course, as I mentioned, it's the only thing that scales globally, at least in terms of electricity. Now, for transportation, there's nothing in the near future that can match fossil fuels. That's just a fact. So you have to be willing to deal with that a lot. You have to suffer a lot, if you, even if you just had a nuclear society, uh, if you decriminalize nuclear. But so what's going on? I mean, when it comes down to it, when you push the, the leaders of this, not the people who really believe that safety is an issue, but you push the leaders, they'll often talk about like, well, it's, you know, it's just wrong. Like we're playing God or they'll, they'll talk about the waste. Like it's wrong for us to create waste that'll be around for a long time. But you can say, well, the waste isn't very dangerous. And it's ultimately like, it's just wrong for us to be impacting the planet this way. And so what's going on is the driving philosophy is what I call the anti- I call it anti-human impact framework. And the, the two basic tenets of it are that human impact on nature is immoral and that it is inevitably self-destructive. And so immoral means that the way we judge the planet and the world is the world is best if we have no impact on it or almost no impact. The best possible earth is the one that would exist had humans never existed or if humans just quote respected nature or wilderness. So like all, you know, the, and this is really how we view the planet today. We view like a good planet as one that we have no impact on and a bad one as one that we have impact on. And my point is we survive through intelligent impacts. That's an anti-human goal. But then in part to make this goal palatable, we have this idea that, well, if we impact the planet too much, we're going to have, it, it's going to bite us. Like mother nature is going to punish us. And this is based on what I call the delicate nurture premise, which is the idea that nature exists in this stable, safe, sufficient and safe, delicate balance 
and that human impact necessarily destroys that balance and us with it. So it's, it's, it has a lot of parallels with religions where you're told to, you're told to sacrifice to something. And if you don't sacrifice, then you're going to, you're going to, you know, burn in hell. And that is kind of what global warming is saying. Like if you don't refuse to sacrifice fossil fuels and also nuclear and hydro, then, you know, the whole earth is, is going to burn. So I, there is this whole anti-human impact philosophy slash framework. And I would just, I would just, I know we don't want to talk about climate much, but I would just point to two things that to think about with that. So one is the people, the lead, our environmental leaders today, their view of today's earth, they portray today's earth as bad and as fossil fuels impact is really bad. And factually by a human standard, that is not true. So you could say plausibly, hey, it's amazing now, but we're sowing the seeds of our destruction. That's like a plausible thing. But notice that most of the thought leaders today act like, yeah, today's earth is bad. We've ruined it. They don't talk about the fact that life is better than ever for the average human being. So that, that indicates there's a difference of standards going on. They're evaluating the world not by the standard of human flourishing, which means humans living to their fullest potential, but rather by this standard of an unimpacted uh, planet. And also this standard is important when you're thinking of climate. You have to ask, is, are we concerned about climate change because we think it's inherently immoral to impact climate? or because we think the impact is actually so bad that it's going to diminish human flourishing. And that's, that's a philosophical question you really need to ask different people, including climate scientists, to differentiate, because I think ultimately most of the concern comes from the fact that we think it's immoral and we expect it to be disastrous, whereas I think, yeah, we do impact the climate, but I don't think there's any reason to expect that it'd be uh, disastrous. And there's every reason to expect that losing fossil fuels would be disastrous. So just to give the human flourishing framework, human flourishing framework means we, we evaluate everything by the standard of human flourishing, including like the world as a whole. So if we're looking at the world as a whole, we think like, is this a place that is maximally conducive to humans flourishing? And that doesn't mean we pave over everything and it's a parking lot or we pollute though, because that's not conducive to human flourishing, but it does mean it's a place with a lot of machine labor producing a lot of value for us that nourishes us, that keeps us safe from nature's threats, that gives us opportunity for fulfillment. That's a human flourishing perspective. And then part of the human flourishing framework is what I call, I, I said before, the wild potential premise, which is recognizing nature in its unimpacted state is not very conducive to human life. We need to radically and intelligently impact it. And therefore we should embrace intelligent impacts, I believe, including uh, fossil fuels. And I, I do think that most of the energy and environmental controversies today are philosophical in their core versus economic or scientific. Certainly, I think the emphasis on wind and solar cannot possibly be economic in nature. I think it's mostly philosophical that people want these things because they think it's just, they think of them as more natural, even though, by the way, they have huge impacts on earth because they do deal with very dilute uh, energy sources, which means they have to take up more space and use more materials, but it's the idea of, of less impact. And then I think on the climate issue, just the, the fixation on this as the only issue and the complete lack of interest in things like 3 billion people have very little energy. I think ult, it's, I can't prove that now because we take more discussion, but I think that that fixation on climate change above everything else shows that we're really focused on minimizing human impact, not maximizing human flourishing. As a more general sort of question we can take from that, it's worth thinking about when you're making evaluations, this is just anyone watching, whatever you think of the particular conclusions we've reached uh, here or that Alex advocates in his books or that we advocate on other uh, programs we have, it's worth really thinking about what standard are you using when you're evaluating things? What standard does it ultimately come back to? And often you'll find that there are competing ones in your head. You know? And for people who are making advocacy claims about COVID, we should close schools, we should open schools, we should wear masks, not wear masks, what Abbott did last week is good or bad, what Cuomo did, what Trump did, what Biden did, uh, on any one of a number of issues where we're thinking about what are the impacts of this? On what standard are we judging these impacts? Um, and you think you'll often find that there's um, confusion about that. That is, people are switching back and forth between what standards they're using and um, getting clarity on that, I think is, is helpful in understanding where different people are coming from and in making up your own mind. So I wanna thank you, Alex, for um, 
uh, pushing people to think about that in the case of fossil fuels in particular. And more generally, since you've got a general project where you're um, trying to take this approach to other fields. Well, and sorry, I guess I need to think, thank you because you've helped me with my thinking about this and you were, you know, big help uh, and helping me think through my my first book, which is not to, not to categorize you as endorsing any particular thing. And I'm looking forward to feedback uh, on my next book soon. Yeah, I, uh, Alex has a sequel to The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, which he sent me a draft of that I'm just started. Um, so uh, we'll be in touch off, off of this show about that soon. And I wanna thank you for uh, coming on and bringing a lot of, giving us all a lot to think about. Oh, and just one thing. It, yeah, if anyone wants to message me about anything, my email is alex at alexepstein.com. Uh, if you're interested in my stuff, I have a mailing list at alexepsteinlist.com. And I post a lot of stuff on Twitter, twitter.com slash alexepstein. And since we're going to share this on your uh, on your page as well, for people who didn't reach this, and that might be most of the people through the Salem Center's page, uh, we have a page on, um, on YouTube to follow. And uh, Carlos, how should they get on our mailing list? email list. Uh, if you go to salemcenter.org, there's a link there. You can get, get, get our programming and everything. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone watching. And uh, I think this has been a fruitful conversation. All right. Thanks, Greg and Carlos. Thanks to the Salem Center for inviting me and also for allowing me to share this panel with listeners and viewers of Power Hour. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, since it was a long panel, I'll wrap up quickly. If you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com to get on my mailing list. Go to alexepsteinlist.com. Definitely make sure to check out energytalkingpoints.com. I have a ton of new points up there. I've been getting a lot of rave reviews about it, but this thing needs to be spread far and wide. So check it out yourself, share it with others. I think you'll just find that there's uh, a gold mine of stuff there. Let's see what else did I forget anything? Oh yeah, I've been tweeting a lot and uh, yeah, get don't don't get sucked into Twitter too much, but if you want to just check my page occasionally, twitter.com slash Alex Epstein. I also give a lot of the highlights every week in my newsletter, which as I said, you can get to at alexepsteinlist.com. Let's see what else. Book update. If you're interested, I am in the throes of editing, working with my publisher, so it's going well, but definitely definitely a good amount to go to make it as good as I would like it to be. But uh, yeah, it's, it's progressing nicely and we will have an update pretty soon about the official, official publication date. So looking forward to that. Uh, speaking of this, my next book, which is called Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Fossil Fuel, Not Less. Uh, this was substantially made possible by our accelerators, people who contribute specifically to our research and development efforts and our promotional efforts. So if you want to become an accelerator, you can do so at industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. That is it for this week. I'll be back next week with a new guest, brand new show. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.